down, hey, the earth is down here. Oh, yeah. Okay, uh, so I get back and do some more things. And I had another rest period. And so this time I took one foot out and did a little agility. And I looked, oh, uh oh, the earth's not down. Oh, there it is up there. To be in the spacesuit outside and to look out in any direction was pretty, pretty neat. It's humans out there. It's humans out here. It's humans on the frontier. When I opened the hatch, I mean, I had the whole universe in front of me. It was, it was spectacular. Then you sort of poke your head out, flip around, and you take a look around, and, you know, it's really a holy moly kind of moment. That was when I first learned, I think, what it the definition of what it truly is to be alone. Being in space, being in Earth orbit, floating uh, is truly a magical experience. It means an exciting day. Uh, it means it's a, it's a day that it's going to be a lot of work, but very rewarding work. NASA's astronauts and their international partners suit up for modern spacewalks with training and experience. Humans suited up, leaving the vehicle and going out on spacewalks. Exploring, you know, going beyond and always going into a situation we've never been to before to fix something, say a space station, to deploy an experiment, or longer term, I think of spacewalking on Mars. So I spend a lot of time thinking about how humans are going to explore Mars suited with some pretty new, cool technology. When floating out in the void of space, they are standing on the shoulders of giants, making new discoveries by building on a prestigious legacy. Why did the Russians put Sputnik up? Why didn't the U.S. do that? Um, we were shooken up by Sputnik and we marshaled our, our resources to put together a, a winning program. One of the things that drove us into human spaceflight was fear, was the fear when Sputnik went overhead in, in 1957 and people began to realize that there was another nation in the world that had the capability of putting something into space that could actually pass over the United States. That's not a good way to do a sustainable program, is through fear. Clearly our motivation was a race. It was to beat the Soviets. And we had to do that for international prestige. And so that, that set us on a sprint to the moon. We will get to the moon within the decade, and we did. Um, but it didn't set us up for a long-term exploration program in space. Way back when we called the terrible 60s, uh, uh, when the country was awash in, in, in campus unrest, civil strife, beginning of a very unpopular war, uh, the Soviets literally owned space at that point in time. Yuri Gagarin back in, uh, in early 1961, uh, made one orbit around the Earth. Alan Shepard became the hero that this country needed. America's initial and successfully crewed space missions, known as Project Mercury, were followed by Project Gemini, the proving ground that would lead to the Apollo missions and the landing on the moon. On the Soviet side, cosmonauts and engineers were doing similar work to extend spaceflight duration, improve rendezvous techniques, and to develop the capability to leave the spacecraft in what was dubbed by NASA as an extravehicular activity, or EVA. In order for us to conquer the, war, the space, we need to learn how to operate outside of the space vehicle. The first successful egress from a spacecraft while in orbit was achieved by cosmonaut Alexei Leonov on March 18, 1965, making him the first person to complete an EVA, or a spacewalk. And what I saw, and I saw just half of the world, because we were 500 kilometers above the Earth, and uh, nobody, even up, up until now, nobody is flying that high. Alexei's, you know, task was to get out and get back in, and he had. He had basically, uh, as best I understand it, uh, um, a fabric tunnel after he got out of an airlock, and he was literally out there in a vacuum of space. And, uh, and once he got through that tunnel, his job was to turn around and get back in, and had a great deal of difficulty get, getting back in because he had to turn 
around in that tunnel with a, a, a pressurized spacesuit at that time, even for us, was like being inhibited by a suit of plaster of Paris. I mean, it was hard to move anything. And he literally had to deflate his spacesuit at that point in time to be able to, uh, to reduce his size to get back in. Later that year, Gemini 4 stood ready to launch from Cape Canaveral, Florida, with the primary objective of gathering the results of an extended four-day mission on both crew and spacecraft. Gemini 4's original semi-conservative mission was then expanded to include, amongst other things, a dramatic exit from the Gemini spacecraft in what would be America's first spacewalk. On June 3, 1965, the second crewed mission of the Gemini series carried James McDivitt and Edward White into space. At 2.46 p.m. Eastern Time, using a handheld gas gun, White stepped out of his spacecraft, leaving crewmate McDivitt behind to witness the vastness of space alone, becoming the first American astronaut to complete a spacewalk. It's very easy to maneuver with the gun. The only problem I have is I haven't got enough fuel. The only thing I wish is I had more. This is the greatest experience. I've, it's just tremendous. We had Ed White's magnificent 20-minute, quote, walk in space. And I don't think you'll ever get any better, any better uh, uh, film. Uh, it was space euphoria, I think, from everyone from from uh, from Ed and Jim McDivitt to everyone on the ground and Mission Control, everybody. I mean, it was spectacular. He had a little gun, he could control his body, he could move where he wanted to go. It set us up. As time progressed, the Gemini program continued to refine and extend EVA procedures as more astronauts followed with tethered spacewalks in Earth's orbit. Well, you know the difficulties that we had in the Gemini program doing spacewalks because the state of the art, the state of the art needs to improve. But you saw the difficulties there when you jump out and you try to get something done. Well, you haven't practiced in the free fall zero G condition. And so it's Newton's second law. You push in something, it moves your body instead of getting the work done. And so that whole business, you see, we just evolved and we grew since, since Leon Elf and, and Gemini on. Americans like Gene Cernan, Michael Collins, Richard Gordon, and Buzz Aldrin continued the competition with the Soviets. In the Gemini days, when they were trying to do the first spacewalks from a, a capsule, uh, the first EVAs, the first spacewalks, were not very uh, productive. The crew members got outside, they didn't have anything to hold on to, they kind of flailed around, uh, they couldn't do fairly simple tasks. And uh, they learned from that that they had to have a better way to train, and they started to use water tanks at that time. Every uh, progressive uh, EVA had uh, different little hang-ups, frustration, uh, overpowering, getting overheated. Next came the Apollo program, with one of its lofty goals to land Americans on the surface of the moon and then return them safely to Earth. We're going to the moon. I mean, hey, we're going to the moon. The Gemini suit, you could pretty much compare it to what this, the launch entry suit was like. You know, it was uh, uh, not custom made, but you could, you know, the length net stuff could be uh, configured so that you did have a certain mobility in the arms and, and, and at the knees. Um, the difference being the Apollo suits were all custom made for each crew member. Three, two, one, zero, all engine running. Liftoff, we have a liftoff, 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. The first steps on the lunar surface were performed by Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. It was July 21st, 1969, and the world irrevocably changed with the steps of men very far away from the Earth. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. I do remember the first landing on the moon, Apollo 11. I remember um, I was, I guess, in high school and staying up and watching that and, and going out and looking at the moon and just marveling about their people up there. 
I think we were all captivated when Neil Armstrong did the ultimate spacewalk, which was to actually go out of his vehicle and end up walking on the surface of another, another body in our solar system. You have a mass with the backpack and the, uh, the body and everything else. Uh, and, and you move around and you kind of think that you can change direction. Uh, but that, that's sort of why at the end of uh, our two hour, two and a half hour EVA, I got in front of the camera and, and bounced around uh, with different ways of moving. I was really personally impressed with the Apollo EVAs and space vlogs. Can you imagine the first humans to ever walk another planetary body to the moon. So just fantastic. And you kind of see that two foot bunny hop. So we had great spacesuits. We kept the Apollo astronauts alive. Once we got the lunar rover set up, uh, we were ready to go be lunar explorers, if you will. Uh, and part of the lunar rover uh, had, had plastic fenders that that's, that when it was folded up, we had to unfold and they slid down to cover the wheels. But the reason we had offenders on these things were because the lunar dust was, was one of the biggest problems we encountered on the surface of the moon. It was uh, almost the texture of graphite, but graphite's a lubricant. This was just the opposite. It would get in and on everything. So I was walking, doing some work around the lunar rover, and I put my rock hammer in my pocket with the handle sticking out, and I caught it under one of those extensions of the fender, and boom, blew it off. The, the dust would have come right over the top and immersed us in all this dust, so we had to figure out a way. We took four maps, four lunar geology maps, and taped them together and took a couple light clamps and uh, clamped them, and it did the job. Uh, <laughs> and what do we tape them with? Duct tape. We went from there into the Skylab program, and we went to the A7LB at that time. So uh, Apollo, you know, so we're on the surface with the A7L, a space suit, and we do have a six of a gravity, and we do have the life support system on the back, which is taking care of all our physiology, the cooling, the oxygen, removing the carbon dioxide, and all the rest of that. In the Skylab program, we were on an umbilical the umbilical provided all of the physiology, if you will. The, the umbilical between the spacewalker and the Skylab space station provided all the life support. When we went into the shuttle program, we went back to riding a backpack. But the big difference between the shuttle and, uh, and Apollo was that um, we, did, we integrated the backpack with the suit itself. So Apollo was you wear the backpack there and you bring the hoses around and connect them. In the shuttle program, we integrated the hard upper torso and the life support system. But importantly to us then was we did away with the zipper. Now the zipper worked, and I had taken a zipper to a vacuum many times. The zipper starts here and it rolls around and it rolls up the back. And the zipper is maybe three feet long, and it is a zipper. And a zipper is the only thing between you and eternity. Spacewalking has actually saved some of our programs, so we can look at Skylab. With Skylab, the habitat was getting very, very hot, and the astronauts had to go outside in their spacesuits, perform the extravehicular activity, and they literally saved Skylab. Without EVA, Skylab would have not been habitable. You know, they had to deploy the solar array, they had to deploy the, the thermal canopy uh, over the damaged area. So EVA saved that, that uh, mission completely. Another great example from the Gamma Ray Observatory mission. Jerry Ross and Jay Apt went out and literally got an antenna deployed and it saved you know, a major observatory. So really important interaction when humans are suited and kind of saving very large missions. My first job in the astronaut office after my uh, initial training program was completed was to start working on EVAs or spacewalks and the equipment. And in fact, uh, we uh, worked uh, with the uh, early crews to design what their spacewalks would be like. Uh, STS-5 was the first planned spacewalk and they had equipment malfunctions which prohibited them from going outside. And then STS-6 was the first one where we actually conducted some spacewalks. So I worked with those crews, helping them to uh, 
figure out what tools we had available to them that they could test out and operate in the vacuum of space out in the payload bay of the orbiter. And uh, then we progressed from there. The suit was not a brand new suit anymore. I had run it through all the, on the floor, that's the 1G test. I had run it through vacuum testing. I had run it through certification where the number of cycles you put on every, all the joints. I've been in the water with it, so it was a friend. Uh, from that, then we started to develop things like the man maneuvering unit, the little rocket backpack that we uh, demonstrated on several flights and used in some cases. In dramatic fashion, doing the first fully untethered spacewalk, Bruce McCandless zoomed about in the manned maneuvering unit. This equipment test would lead to the retrieval of stranded satellites on subsequent missions years later. And I uh, was really jealous of Bruce McCandless when he had a backpack and, and went out uh, a ways without a tether and uh, maneuvered around. Over the following years, extravehicular activity became one of the space traveler's most exciting and necessary tools in his or her tool belt. It was July 17, 1984, as cosmonaut Svetlana Savitskaya broke the proverbial glass ceiling and became the first woman to walk in space. Catherine Sullivan followed shortly after on October 11th, becoming the first female American astronaut to perform a spacewalk. This is the uh, first chance I had to stick my head out the hatch on our EVA on day seven. As time progressed, so did the need for advanced technology and utilities. Complicated missions and space program saving maneuvers are the essence of NASA's extravehicular activity. There was uh, one time when I was on the end of the mechanical arm, it was on the Hubble mission, and I was being moved from one place to another, and you really have no sensation of movement when you're on that arm. It's just so smooth, um, there's nothing, there's no drag of the water pulling you back, and so you don't really know you're moving. Um, and I was just, I was working on the tools, I was putting the sockets on for the next, whatever task I had to do next, and the guys stopped, and they said, you have to look at this, you just have to stop and look. And so I stopped and looked, and we were over the Gulf of Mexico, we could see the entire of North America, and we could see aurora up over Canada, and it was just an amazing view. Uh, we started to develop uh, little power tools. We uh, developed more wrenches and other kinds of tools that we could use for other types of failures that we identified in the payload bay door mechanisms to, to remove debris or to disconnect things should they, should they not function properly. From the Apollo program's deep space missions around and to the moon, to the U.S. Skylab, shuttle, and International Space Station programs, spacewalkers have suited up. On board the spacecraft, you've got the, today, two spacewalk crew members who go out, work cooperatively together. They become brother and sister, brother and brother, sister and sister. They learn how to work as a very uh, coherent team. They, they actually understand each other's moves. They know where they're supposed to be. You've got, uh, nowadays, a robotic operator who's generally moving one, at least one of the crew members around on a robotic arm. You've got the IV crew member, the intervehicular crew member, who is, for all intents and purposes, the choreographer. Has the whole mission kind of committed to memory, knows when somebody's out of position, knows when somebody's about to get too far away where they can be safely tethered. Back on Earth, in the Mission Control Center, you have the primary person on console that is the, the EV uh, or the extravehicular controller. In the back room, they probably have uh, anywhere from 25 to 100 people who are looking at data from each of the, the spacewalking astronauts. They're looking at data from the spacewalk that's actually going on. And then somewhere in the world, like at a place um, that built the spacesuit or uh, somebody that designed the procedure that's being done, whether it's in Denver, Colorado, or Connecticut, uh, they're also looking on and, and they have their own data that they're evaluating and getting all that back into mission control in Houston, telling the flight control team, okay, we see this developing or we see this happening, you need to let the crew know. So uh, probably thousands of people supporting the development of, of the types of spacewalks that we're gonna do and, uh, and then hundreds actually involved in the spacewalk on that particular day. It was part of our training to make sure that, you know, even though you might be nervous, try not to show them that you're nervous Everything had to be laid out perfectly, you know. I mean, fr from the start, you know, you had your checklist. It was all laid out properly. You know, which pocket every pin went in, uh, you know, uh, even down to where the pocket they wanted their, 
their sandwich put in. It has been the astronauts' mantra to train, test, and succeed. One of the things that astronauts learn to do to, uh, to look at a situation and don't panic about anything, you'll make it worse, uh, but think carefully, uh, did you do something wrong and then fix it? Well, the astronaut prayer, which is, please God, don't let me screw this up, that's the first thing. I think the biggest fear that, that I had, and maybe many astronauts as well, is not that I was going to get hurt, it's that I was going to mess up. Because everybody's watching, um, you have such a limited time out there to get done what needs to be done, and you really, really don't want to make a mistake. It was cold, uh, so that was a little surprise, but we should have anticipated cold, but it turns out at that point we had only done hot spacewalk until STS-6, they had all been worn. The STS-125 uh, crew, which was the final Hubble servicing mission, um, that almost none of us thought they would be able to successfully complete five back-to-back-to-back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back -to -back -to -back EVAs and do all that they were supposed to do. And they not only completed them in spite of obstacles at, almost on, at every turn on almost every single EVA, but they did them superbly and left Hubble in, in, in incredible shape. And, I think they did a, a tremendous service to planetary science, astrophysics, and, and just the field of, of spacewalks in terms of showing people that if you really work hard at it and you plan it and you execute the way you plan, uh, there's nothing we can't do. When you're doing a spacewalk on orbit, you're in your own spaceship. It's your spacesuit, but it keeps you from the vacuum outside and your crewmates inside the space shuttle. I had one moment on the Hubble Space Telescope mission where Drew Feustel, my spacewalking partner, was on the other side of the telescope, and I was holding onto a handrail looking up at the Earth go by behind the Hubble. Uh, and it was a truly remarkable moment, but I did realize you know, how far away we were from the Earth's atmosphere, from our homes, uh, from our companions inside the space shuttle. And I wouldn't say that I felt a sense of loneliness, but a sense of awe you know, that we're doing these kind of things, that we're able to, to fix the Hubble, to orbit the Earth. Through spacewalks, complex problems have been solved in extreme ways, such as fixing the Hubble Space Telescope's blurry vision, turning a possible billion-dollar piece of space junk into one of the most revered scientific instruments of human history. Missions like Hubble tested the metal of spacewalkers, an elite breed among an already out-of-this-world group of adventurers. I'd say that on Hubble, it's a, it's a very fine motor skill, tuned in, very close in, a lot of hands work. Uh, so it's almost like doing surgery when you're on Hubble in a suit versus being a longshoreman when you're on space station or you're just hanging, moving big blivets around and you're changing stuff out. And that tradition continued with the Wall of EVAs, which built the tremendously successful International Space Station. It's been 50 years since NASA's first EVA, when Ed White went out on Gemini 4. We've come a long way since that first one. Uh, building the International Space Station, it was very, very EVA intensive. And when we were planning for it, everybody talked about the wall of EVA. We're never going to be able to accomplish all this. And when you look back on what we accomplished, it was pretty darn amazing. So on my first flight, we were right in the middle of the construction of the space station. Um, and so, of course, every shuttle flight that went up was full of spacewalks and just putting pieces together. Every single EVA was an important and necessary component of the assembly sequence. So uh, I think we all feel that, you know, we had a hand in laying the keystone or however you want to describe it. To see the ISS now and the spacewalks that they do to go out and do repairs, I mean, it's just incredible. Station is more than 14 years old built by spacewalkers and continues to be maintained and upgraded through spacewalks in the most advanced spacesuits the world has ever seen. Spacewalks are not, uh, they look like they're incredible fun and they probably are for the crew member when you really get down to it, but we must never forget how dangerous they are. I felt something that was not un unexpected. I felt cold water on the back of my hand and, and that surprised me. I, I contacted the ground, which is the first thing you would do when, when something that you're not expecting comes up. So I asked Houston for, for advice. You know, I said, I, I feel water in my helmet, but what it feels like a lot of water. The, the ground doesn't have 
a lot of information on the suit. They, they can monitor some things, they have telemetry about my status, my battle status, and they, they know how the suit is performing, but a lot of things we, we couldn't tell at that point. Is, is the water increasing in my helmet, in the back of my helmet? I, I couldn't tell. Uh, the ground couldn't tell that we're trying to come up with what could be the possible problem and the solution. Finally uh, came the decision from, uh, from the ground to, to take the safest option, which is we are, we're going to terminate this EDA. Chris and Luca, just for you guys, uh, based on what we heard with Lucas saying that uh, water is in his eyes now and it seems to be increasing, uh, we think we're going to terminate EVA case for EV2. And so when they told me, OK, Luca, you're going to travel back to the airlock and Chris is going to clean up and, and then follow you, that's what we did. And I started translating back to the airlock. I had to, to go upside down and translating with my head towards the, the, the ground. And it always happens, a lot of things happen at the same time. Uh, the sun went down at that, at that point. You go, from, you go to zero. Darkness, no visibility, and cold. Um, and at the same time, the water sloshed around my helmet and it, and it covered my eyes and, and my nose and my ears. So uh, all at once I was isolated, both being outside in my spacesuit, but I was also sensorially isolated. I couldn't see uh, and I, I couldn't hear. And and I didn't quite know where I was, how to, uh, to find my way back to the, to the airlock. At that point, it, it was obvious to me that I needed to, to go back to the airlock by myself and do it as fast as I could because I could still breathe through my mouth, but I didn't know how much water was in the helmet, and I didn't know if there would be more water in the helmet. Thankfully, we, we spent hundreds of hours underwater in the neutral buoyancy lab learning the configuration of the space station, learning how to use our spacesuit, learning how to navigate. And so using, using that experience and using my knowledge of the suit and everything I had with me, I was able to, to find my way in, in the dark, in the blind, um, back to the airlock. Once I found the airlock though, everything became a little better because once I opened the thermal cover, the airlock is illuminated and that made a huge difference because now I knew I knew where I was I, and I knew I could get inside by myself. And the end of it was that uh, at that point I had no communication whatsoever. I couldn't hear my, I couldn't hear anything, I couldn't talk, my ears were filled with water. But, uh, but I was looking up uh, and as soon as they opened the hatch between the space station and the airlock, I saw my crewmates and the look on their faces, they were so worried and, and so relieved at the same time and they pulled me out and as soon as they could they um, they deflated the suit and uh, unlocked the helmet and, uh, and the look on their faces and seeing their faces was a very happy moment for me. I felt so relieved and, and so happy that they were all around me. Today, the International Space Station is being used as a proving ground to conduct the research and test the technologies that will take humans beyond low Earth orbit and deeper into the solar system than ever before. To the area around the moon, to an asteroid, and on to Mars. We will pioneer space, not just to visit, but to stay. We're gonna migrate out over the next uh, five to 10 years uh, into repositioning humanity in lunar orbit. So we will spend most of our time uh, orbiting the moon and doing more technology development, but learning basically how we operate in a, in a low gravity or no gravity environment, because that's the way it will be when we go to Mars. Mars's gravity is less than, than Earth's. Operating there will be significantly different than operating here in low Earth orbit. When we do the asteroid redirect mission and we, we reposition an asteroid into a stable retrograde orbit around the moon, um, then the, the dominant gravity for that group of, of explorers, if you will, is going to be the asteroid itself and that's going to be a very 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 low gravity field if any at all so we've got a lot of, of development of tactics techniques and procedures never know when you build a piece of hardware the guys back in the 70s and gals that, that built and designed and tested the original emus uh, which we're still flying today by the way the, the life support systems are still the original life support systems that we had um, 30 some years ago you never know where that hardware is going to end up. To see that suit, you know, 
To see it go on over the decades and into we never planned on hundreds of spacewalks. And a key thing there is in structural integrity is you identify weakness before failure. From here, NASA engineers, technicians, and astronauts will figure out new ways to overcome the next set of challenges. We decided to orbit the Earth a lot instead of going deeper into space, and now I think it's time for us to take that step beyond orbiting the Earth and moving on. We don't have the same momentum we had when we had an enemy that we were afraid of. So we are not in competition as much as I think we need to be in, in uh, cooperation with other nations in order to move all of us forward and out into space. Mars is really extreme, which is the great part about it. It's challenging. So when we get to Mars, you're going to need to be provided your life support and pressure with a spacesuit, but it'll have to be really something, something new in terms of to be very lightweight, be very mobile. We don't really have a locomotion suit. We have spacesuits for the vacuum of microgravity. So you're weightless, which is great, but that's a very different environment. Now when we get to Mars, we have gravity, 3 ace gravity, so we're bipedal again. So we're gonna be walking, bending, or going there to search for life, looking for fossils and digging things up. So you really are an explorer. So it is akin to Lewis and Clark expedition and you know, exploring and, and moving out into the west. It's really the, the next frontier. For anyone who goes on another EVA stroll back on a moon or on Mars, and we'll do both one day. I, I know that'll happen. Take duct tape. We are currently further along than ever before in human history on our journey to Mars. American engineers and scientists around the country are working hard to develop the technologies, including new spacesuits, that astronauts will use to one day live and work on the Red Planet. Next stop, Mars.